Max Weber. Near the end of his career, Max Weber viewed the fledgling discipline of sociology in the following way. Sociology is a science concerning itself with the interpretive understanding of social action and thereby with a causal explanation of its course and consequences. We shall speak of action insofar as the acting individual attaches a subjective meaning to his behavior, be it overt or covert, omission or acquiescence. Acquiescence. Action is social insofar as its subjective meaning takes account of the behavior of others and is thereby oriented in its course. Weber believed that this definition would allow him to achieve two interrelated goals that, taken together, signify an, alto an altogether original approach to the study of social organization. First, he wanted to understand the origin and unique characteristics of modern Western societies. Second, he wanted to construct a system of abstract concepts that would be useful in describing and, hence, understanding social action in such societies. Without a set of clear and precise concepts, Weber argued, systematic social scientific research is impossible. The result was a series of concepts designed to increase understanding of the modern world. Weber's Methodology of the Social Sciences in 1904, Weber posed a fundamental question. In what sense are there objectively valid truths in those disciplines concerned with social and cultural phenomena? All his subsequent writings can be seen as an answer to this simple query. Indeed, Weber's goal was to show that objective research was possible in those academic disciplines dealing with subjectively meaningful phenomena. The way he pursued this goal is presented here in two parts. First, his depiction of the problem of values in sociological research is shown. This was the central methodological issue for Weber. If sociology were to be a true science of society, he believed it has to be objective. Second, he thought that every science required a conceptual map, an inventory of the key concepts describing the phenomenon being studied and he began to develop such a system of concepts, labeling them ideal types. The problem of values. During Weber's time, many observers did not think that an objective social science was plausible because it seemed impossible to separate values from the research process. So most scholars attempting to describe human behavior infused their analyses with political, religious, and other values. Karl Marx's writings constitute an extreme example of this tactic. Weber confronted the problem of values by observing that sociological inquiry should be objective or, to his term, to use his term, value-free. Having said that, he then suggested how values and economic interest were connected to social scientific analyses. Value-free sociology Weber's use of the term value-free is unfortunate because it implies that social sciences should have no values at all, which is plainly an impossibility. What he meant, what he meant is that researchers' personal values and economic interests should not affect the process of social scientific analysis. He believed that if such factors influenced the research process, the structure of social action could not be depicted could not be depicted objectively. This fundamental concern with attaining objective and verifiable knowledge links all the sciences, natural and social. In Weber's view, sociology should not be a moral science. It is not possible to state scientifically which norms, values, or patterns of action are correct or the best, but rather, it is only possible to describe them objectively. Weber believed that such descriptions would represent a considerable achievement. After all, they did not then exist. Thus, unlike many others, Weber explicitly distinguished between what ought to be the sphere of values and what is the sphere of science, arguing that sociology should focus only on the latter. The distinction implies what Weber considered the underlying value that ought to guide social scientific inquiry, the search for truth. Another implication of Weber's argument 
for a value-free sociology is that the new science reflects an ongoing historical process in which magic and other forms of inherited wisdom become less acceptable as means of explaining events. Weber referred to this change as the process of rationalization, and it is a dominant theme in his work. Unlike Marx, who used the dialectic as a leitmotif, Weber believed that social life is becoming increasingly rationalized, in the sense that people led relatively methodological methodical lives. They rely on reason, but trust by objective evidence. The rationalization of the economy, for example, by means of improved accounting, the use of technology, and other methods, produced modern capitalism. The rationalization of government, by reliance on technical training and legal procedures, for example, resulted in the rise of the modern political state. The sciences, of course, are the archetypal meth methodical disciplines. In a rationalized discipline, values should not affect the research process, but they remain relevant. The connection between values and science. Although Weber knew that the separation between values and science is difficult to maintain in practice, the distinction highlighted the relevance of values before and after the research process. The choice of topics comes before the research takes place. The only basis for making such a decision is scientists, religious beliefs, economic interest, and other values, which lead some of them to each topic. But having chosen a topic for study, according to Weber's dictum, scientists must follow an objective research process. This, the situation is more complex when dealing with public policy issues. Given a specific political goal, Weber said a sociologist could determine a. the alternative strategies for achieving it, b. the outcomes of using different strategies, and c. the consequences of attaining the goal. Once this is done, however, there is no scientific way of choosing public policies. Selecting one goal rather than another and one strategy rather than another ultimately depends on people's political values their economic interest, and other non-objective factors. Having said that the research process must be objective, and the sphere of values and the sphere of science must be kept separate, Weber drew a unique conclusion. Unlike nearly all the other classical sociologists, except Marx, Weber rejected the search for general laws in favor of historical theories that provided an interpretive understanding of social action and a causal explanation of its course and consequences. A search for universal laws necessarily excludes from consideration important and unique historical events. Weber summarized his position in the following way. For the knowledge of historical phenomena and their concreteness, the most general laws, because they are most devoid of content, are also the least valuable. The more comprehensive the validity or scope of a term, the more it leads us away from the richness of reality, since in order to include the common elements of the largest possible number of phenomena, it must necessarily be as abstract as possible, and hence devoid of content. In the social sciences, the knowledge of the universal or general is never valuable in itself. In effect, then, Weber was most interested in focusing on the big empirical questions, such as why capitalism had originated in the West rather than somewhere else, and he knew that emphasis on the development of general theories would not allow for examination of such issues. Ideal types were his method for dealing with these issues. Ideal types. To study social phenomena, Weber argued that it is necessary to have a description of the key elements of phenomenon. The goal is to describe forms of action and patterns of social organization, while seeking to identify the historical causes of these forms and patterns. The use of what he termed ideal types is central to this approach. An ideal type, or pure type, 
summarizes the basic properties of a social phenomenon, which, in turn, can help the search for its historical causes. Weber developed two different kinds of ideal types, historical and general, following as a summary of each. Historical ideal types. Historical events can be described by analytically accentuating their key components. For example, in Weber's famous analysis of the spirit of capitalism, he drew up a list of the features of this belief system. Once the essence or pure form of this belief system is highlighted, it then becomes possible to seek the causes for the emergence of, the, of this distinctive historical event. And in Weber's analysis, the emergence of Protestantism appears to have been the key historical cause of the spirit of capitalism, as we will examine later. Thus, a historical ideal type accentuates the key properties of specific events in history, but it does more. Once the key components of a property of the social world are delineated, the search for causes is given focus and direction. General Ideal Types Although Weber did not believe that general laws of human organization could be produced in the social sciences, he still wanted to make generalizations about generic social phenomena. This desire led him to formulate ideal types of phenomena that are always present in human action. These ideal types do not describe historical events, but rather they accentuate certain key properties of actors, actions, and social organizations in general. The most famous of these more abstract and general ideal types is Weber's conceptualization of the types of action. According to Weber, people's actions can be classified in four analytically distinct ways. The first type of action is the instrumentally rational, which occurs when means and ends are systematically related to each other based on knowledge. Weber knew that the knowledge that people possessed might not be accurate. Thus, both the ring dance and the timing of a stock purchase are instrumentally rational acts from the point of view of the dancers and the buyers. Even though the means and link might be based on magical beliefs or rumors, respectively. Thus, instrumentally rational action occurs in all societies. Nonetheless, Weber said the archetypal form of instrumentally rational action is based on objective, ideally scientific knowledge. Action buttressed by objective knowledge is more likely to be effective. Its effectiveness is one reason why the spheres in which instrumentally rational action occurs have widened over time. And its pervasiveness in modern societies reflects the historical process of rationalization. The second type of action is value rational, which is a behavior undertaken in light of one's basic values. Weber emphasized that value rational action always involves commands or demands which, in the actor's opinion, are binding. Religious people avoiding alcohol use because of their faith, parents paying for their children's braces and college education, politicians passing laws, and soldiers obeying orders are acting as a result of their values. The essential characteristic of value rational action is that it constitutes an end in itself. The third type of action is traditional, which is behavior determined by ingrained habituation. Weber's point is that in a context where beliefs and values are second nature and patterns of action have been stable for many years, people usually respond to situations from habit. In a sense, they regulate their behavior by customs handed down across generations. In such societies, people resist altering long-established ways of living, 
which are often sanctified in religious terms. As a result, when confronted with new situations or choices, they often continue in the old ways. Traditional action typifies behavior in contexts where choices are or are perceived to be limited. Traditional action thus characterizes people in pre-industrial societies. The fourth type of action is effectual, which is behavior determined by people's emotions in a giving situation. A parent slapping a child and a football player punching an opponent are examples. This type of behavior occurs, of course, in all societies, although it constitutes a residual category that Weber acknowledged but did not explore in detail. These types of action classify behavior by visualizing its four pure forms. Although Weber knew that actual situations would not perfectly reflect these concepts, they provide a common reference point for comparison. That is, a variety of empirical cases can be systematically compared with one another and with the ideal type, in this case the types of social action. This strategy is presented in figure 5.1, ideal types thus represent for Weber a quasi-experimental method. The ideal serves as the functional equivalent of the control group in an experiment. Variations or deviations from the ideal are seen as a result of causal forces or a stimulus in a real laboratory experiment. And an attempt is then made to find these causes. In this sense, Weber could achieve two goals. One, analytically accentuate the elements of social action, and two, discover the causes of various, of various types of action. Weber's image of social organization. Weber's analysis of social organization is detailed and complex. And indeed, it is often difficult to get a sense of how he visualized society as a whole. As noted earlier, Weber defined sociology as a study of social action. And as we have seen in the, in the analysis of ideal types, he felt that there are four basic types of action. Instrumental rational, value rational, traditional, and effectual. Thus, human behavior is guided or, in Weber's terms, oriented by considerations of rationality, tradition, or effect. These types of action, however, need not be mutually exclusive. They can be combined, although some orientations are more compatible with each other than others. For example, effectual and value rational are more likely to be combined than, say, instrumental, rational, and traditional. Still, even when combined, Weber implied that one type of action would generally dominate a social relationship. As is typical of Weber, the nature of social relationships, like the actions forming them, is portrayed as an ideal type. There are two basic kinds of social relationships arising out of social action. One is communal relationships, which are formed by individuals' feelings for each other, with such feelings based on affectional or traditional actions. The other is associative relationships, which are based on rationality, whether instrumental, rational, or value rational. Thus, in Weber's view, the two basic types of social relationships communal and associational, are motivated by a split in the four types of action, with one of these splits revolving around the two types of rational action, value and instrumental, and the other around effectual and traditional orientations. Social relationships, whether communal or associative, are generally connected to what Weber termed legitimated orders. An order appears to be Weber's way 
of conceptualizing the larger structures that are built from social relationships. Action and social relationships almost always occur within the context of an existing legitimated order. Such orders guarantee that actions and social relationships will be conducted in accordance with maxims or rules, the violation of which will bring about negative sanctions on those failing to meet their obligations. Thus, the structure connecting the more micro processes of action and social relationships to more macro levels of reality is the legitimated order. Like so many concepts in Weber's work, there is a classification of orders into two basic types. One is organized around subjective guarantees that social relationships will proceed in accordance with the rules of the other. With this subjectivity arising from one of three routes, one, effect, or emotional surrender to the order, two, value rationality, or a belief in the absolute validity of the order as the most efficient means to an end, and three, religious beliefs that salvation depends on the order. The other type of order is organized by expectations among actors of certain external effects that are predictable outcomes to actions undertaken. Thus, because actors calculate their actions in accordance with expected outcomes, Vapor implied that this kind of order is organized by instrumental rationality. Weber then shifted to the basis of legitimation of orders, that is, routes by which actors ascribe rights to the order to control their conduct. Again, as is typical with Weber, there are several basic types of legitimation. A. Tradition, or the way things have always been. B. Affectional, or emotional attachments to the way things are organized. C. Value rational, or the deduction that the current order is the best possible way of organizing actions, and D, legal, which is composed of binding agreements entered into by considerations of instrumental rationality among actors or by an external authority that is considered to have the right to impose and enforce agreements. In figure 5.2, we have diagrammed what we think is Weber's intent, although we must confess that, despite all the definitions and categories, Weber's analytical scheme is far from precise or clear. The subject matter of sociology is social action, whereby actors take cognizance of each other's behaviors.